Hey guys, what's going on? So I got this video recommended to me recently and I just had to click on it and watch it. And I figured, hey, I might as well react to this video. I'm sure there's gonna be some good, interesting stuff in here. There's gonna be some good stuff, some bad stuff, uh, some true stuff, maybe some things that are not actually quite that true. Um, I don't know exactly just yet. I'm watching this for the very first time, just like you. We're gonna watch it together here. I thought this was a very funny uh, video. However, it's done very, very well. This uh, title here is Why Utah is So Weird. It has 1.6 million views in the last four months. Now, this is a, a video that's put out by Wendover Productions. They do kind of like, I think it's kind of like documentary type videos, um, but just talking about, hey, here's why Utah is weird. So let's, you know, jump into this and uh, get started. We're going to kind of jump around. It's a little bit of a long video, um, but we'll kind of jump around and um, let's, let's get started. Mormons. Mormons made Utah weird. That's the answer. In a few more words, a century and a half of Mormon voting majority in an isolated insular state made Utah anomalous compared to the country of which it's a part. And so, yeah, I definitely want to point out that this is, um, you know, starting off with the Mormon culture, which is obviously a very big part of Utah um, at its core, right? Utah was founded by the Mormon pioneers. So there is a big population here. If you didn't know, I think that's pretty obvious to most people. It has become incredibly diverse. I'm sure that he'll talk about this here in just a minute, um, but it has gotten incredibly diverse and there's more and more people moving into the state all the time. Um, and so it's really uh, gaining that diversity, but definitely 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, uh, extremely high LDS Mormon population. Part. And in a few more words than that, well, on first glance, Utah appears the intuitive average of its neighbors. It's a melange of the red rock deserts of Nevada and Arizona, the deep red politics of Idaho and Wyoming, the glitzy ski towns of Colorado and Wyoming, and the ruggedly independent, outdoors-loving culture of the entire Mountain West region. But it's also got some things its neighbors do not. A lot of great points there, actually. Um, that's actually all spot on. Do not. It's got drive through soda shops. Yes, we do. We have drive through soda shops. It's kind of funny this is coming up in the first 40 seconds. Basically what this is, is it's a soda, it's a coffee shop, but for soda, right? It's exactly what it is, what it sounds like. They take a soda, they add all of these syrups and flavors and sugar into them. I've never actually had it. I've never tried it once. Um, I'm not a big soda drinker. I rarely, rarely, rarely drink soda, um, but these are incredibly popular here in Utah. Utah pioneered this style of shop where instead of getting coffee or tea, one gets so-called dirty soda. Carbonated drinks mixed with assortments of syrups, creams, or juices to make a cocktail-like concoction. In Salt Lake City, Swig, a leading dirty soda chain, has nearly as many locations as sector-dominating Starbucks. The reason for this is that most of the half of the state that are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, follow the word of wisdom, purported revelations from God delivered to the church's founder, Joseph Smith. Along with alcohol and tobacco, the text prohibits so-called hot drinks, which is interpreted by the church to mean coffee and tea, regardless of whether they're actually hot. Therefore, to fill the role that coffee shops do elsewhere, Utah entrepreneurs started selling dirty soda instead, and it's become such a hit that Swig has now spread to Idaho, Arizona, Texas, Oklahoma, and Arkansas as well. Other anomalies stem from the same text. For example, up until the 2002 Salt Lake City Olympics, public bars were technically not allowed at all. Anything that functioned like a bar had to run as a private members club and sell $5 temporary memberships to allow entry. Restaurants, meanwhile, could have- That is very true. Things have changed, um, but definitely growing up here, uh, there was not the ability to have, um, you know, a bar uh, in, in an open space. You had to actually have this temporary membership that he's talking about. And then even in restaurants, which he's going to discuss here in just a second, you had to have like an opaque glass that was in front of the bartender uh, so that you couldn't actually see them pouring or mixing drinks. Physical structures that looked and operated like bars, but only if they had so-called Zion curtains. State alcohol laws prohibited establishments operating with restaurants. I should also mention that has now changed. That is no longer the law. If you come here, you go to a bar, you go to a restaurant, you're going to be able to order a drink just like you would at any other restaurant um, or, or whatever in any other location. Restaurant alcohol licenses from allowing alcoholic drinks. Although, again, let me add this. There's not as many places that do actually sell al alcohol. Again, because of the LDS population, there's a lot of people who don't drink. So it's just not as common or popular here as you'll find in other states. Also, again, on this note, uh, you cannot buy wine or liquor at any grocery store. You do have to go to a state approved or a state run um, liquor store in order to find those things. To be prepared in view of customers under the logic that this would help prevent excessive drinking and the normalization of alcohol for those under 21. Similarly, waiters were prohibited from proactively offering diners a wine list and could only furnish it when asked. While these laws were eventually eased, Utah still has some of the strictest alcohol laws in America. It's the only state with a 0.05 drunk driving blood alcohol content limit rather than the standard looser 0.08, and all but low alcohol beers and beverages are sold exclusively through state-run stores with limited opening hours. In fact, all of these stores are closed each July 24th. While a perfectly normal day for the rest of the United States, each July 24th in Utah is what's called Pioneer Day. 
It celebrates the arrival of the first group of Mormon settlers to the Salt Lake Valley. Across the state, this is celebrated almost as a second Independence Day with Main Street parades, backyard parties, and evening fireworks. Uh, that's exactly true. You, We do have the 24th of July. It's a state holiday. It's basically like 4th of July all over again. Fireworks, parties, barbecue, pool parties, whatever. Everything's exactly same. and perhaps pointedly, to accommodate this extra holiday, Utah does not typically celebrate Columbus Day each October, the holiday to commemorate the arrival of the Italian explorer to the Americas. Rather than celebrate European arrival to the Americas, they celebrate Mormon arrival to Utah. The wall between church and state in Utah can be, at times, blurry. For example, each of Utah's public high schools are allowed to permit, upon parents' request, up to an hour of so-called release time when students can learn off campus. In practice, this means for religious education. Utah law includes a litany of rules to make it clear that these off-campus religious classes are not technically part of the public education system, since that would likely violate the First Amendment. But day-to-day, Latter-day Saint seminary classes slide into the Utah high school experience almost seamlessly. At Bonneville High School near Ogden, for example, the seminary is right across the street and it schedules its classes to correspond with the high school schedule. So for fourth period, for example, one just walks across the street and learns about Joseph Smith. In fact, it's almost impossible to find a Utah high school without an adjacent seminary. At Dixie High School in St. George, in fact, the seminary sits in the exact center of the campus. While technically on its own property and fenced off, its main entrance faces the high school's parking lot rather than its own, and it sits on the direct path between the high school and its baseball fields. It is quite literal. Yeah, that's a really good point about um, the seminary buildings. Um, again, obviously, with the culture being the way that it is, uh, it's become very standard practice for this to occur. Um, it's not something that's required. It's totally optional for students to attend. The step, the seminary is what they call it, uh, the release time. Uh, this is something that they can definitely do on their own time. If they choose to do so, you don't have to do it um, if you don't want to, but it definitely does blur that line between public education and the religious aspect, aspect of um, of church. But in my opinion, I don't think it's really a big deal. If you want to go, great, go. If you don't want to go, that's fine too, right? It's not affecting anybody else. Um, it does make it a little bit blurry, but I don't think it's really anything different um, than saying, oh, I go to a Catholic school or I go to a Christian school or I go to, you know, this XYZ school where they teach religious aspects as well. So um, it's, it is separate, but it does look a little bit weird, especially from the outside. It is quite literally unavoidable. Considered an inevitability, many new high schools in the state draw a location for the seminary into their original architectural plans and count on selling the land to the church without a second thought. After all, a strong majority of the Utah voting public does not consider this coziness between church and state controversial. It's just simply convenient. Among the U.S.'s Tudor interpretation of the First Amendment as it relates to the separation of religion and government. For example, the majority of Republicans polled believe city governments should be allowed to put religious symbols on public property, while 27% believe the federal government should flat out stop enforcing the separation of church and state entirely. So with a strong, deeply religious voting majority, it's perhaps no surprise that Utah is an incredible Republican Party stronghold. Now, Utah is certainly known as a red state. It feels right at home with its conservative neighbors in Idaho, Montana, and the Dakotas, but perhaps the part that would surprise is how they compare. Based on self-reported party affiliation, Utah is the most Republican of these states. In fact, among all states, Utah has the second highest portion of its population identifying as Republican and the second lowest. It's actually kind of surprising that this is a, uh, I mean, this is pretty high, 54%, but I think from just the general feel or what I would have expected if you had uh, if you maybe guess, you know, or estimate what this number would have been, I would have easily said somewhere between 60 to 70 percent, actually. So, uh, but 54, I mean, that's not too far off from even, I guess. This portion identifying as Democrats. Now, this statistic almost certainly surprises, and with good reason. Utah does not look, feel, or even act like the second most conservative state in the nation. Across the U.S., there is a consistent correlation between urbanization rate and party affiliation. The urban areas are Democrat strongholds, with about 62% of voters going for the party, while rural areas lean Republican, gaining 54% of voters. Therefore, Same thing at here state-by-state state level, the states with low urbanization rates tend to have high portions of their electorate. Hey, really quick, guys, I just want to mention, if you're looking at buying, selling, or investing in real estate here in Utah, please reach out to me. My team and I service the entire state. I've had thousands of people now reach out to me over the last couple of years asking about moving here, or they already live here, and they want to buy, sell, or invest in real estate, and I would love for you to do the same. If I can help you in any way, my information's here on the screen. Please call, text, or email me anytime. I absolutely love hearing from you guys. Voting for the Republican Party and vice versa. Yet Utah is the seventh most urbanized state in the country. More than four-fifths of the state lives in the Salt Lake City metro area, meaning it completely bucks this trend. Another broken correlation in Utah relates to LGBTQ rights. The Public Religion Research Institute conducts a large annual survey that includes a question about support for non-discrimination protection for LGBTQ people. 
as in whether there should be legal protections preventing landlords, for example, from denying a lease to an individual based on their sexual orientation or gender identity. Fascinatingly, 86% of those surveyed in Utah were in support of such laws. The only state to boast higher support was Hawaii, meaning Utah, the second most Republican state in the nation, was more in support of making discrimination against queer people illegal than the people of California, New York, Massachusetts, or any other liberal stronghold. And this does not appear a statistical anomaly. After all, in 2015, the Utah legislator did something no other Republican controlled- That is actually quite surprising. I did not know that. Um, that's actually, again, really surprising. Legislator had ever done. They passed a bill expanding non-discrimination protections for LGBTQ people. From then on, sexual orientation and gender identity became protected classes for matters of employment and housing. The bill in question, SB 296, was dubbed the Utah Compromise since it had simultaneous support by the Republican Party and the Church of Latter-day Saints and organizations like the ACLU and the Human Rights Campaign. Of course, it was a true compromise. No by the way, I'm sure there's going to be more mention of this, but the LDS Church does have a huge pull in Utah politics because a lot of the members are the politicians here in the state and also because there's so much church property there's such a big church presence here in the area that they have a lot of pull they have a lot of say uh, just like you know a major corporation would the church is the same exact way here in utah it's changing over the last couple of years it's changed dramatically and i think it's going to continue in that path excuse me but um i do think that there's going to be uh, more changes coming and it's going to continue to uh, look a lot like the other states in the future years the bill excludes religious organizations and their affiliates like schools and hospitals from the same non-discrimination regulations, meaning a religious school could theoretically fire a teacher, for example, based solely on their gender identity. And in practice, this means that Brigham Young University, run by the LDS Church, can continue its codified prohibition of, quote, same-sex romantic behavior by students. But simultaneously, the bill isn't an isolated case of support for certain LGBTQ rights in Utah. In 2020, it once again became the first state with a Republican-controlled legislature by students. But simultaneously, the bill isn't an isolated case of support for certain LGBTQ rights in Utah. In 2020, it once again became the first state with a Republican-controlled legislator to ban- All right, we're gonna jump ahead here. Students ...who graduated from high school in the state to pay in-state college tuition rates at Utah public universities. In 2005, it passed a law that allowed for the issuance of driver's licenses to the group. Still today, it's one of only 20 with such a law and is the only one of these that went red in the last presidential election. In 2019, Utah then tweaks the maximum penalty for misdemeanor crimes to make it easier for undocumented immigrants to avoid deportation by federal authorities. In 2022, they made it so fewer employers were required to check a new hire's immigration status. And in 2023, they expanded eligibility for taxpayer-funded health insurance to certain children of undocumented immigrants. This culminated in this- Very interesting to see there's been a lot of changes for undocumented immigrants. Um, I won't speak to the, the matter of whether this is good or bad, but just very interesting to see um, that there's constantly changes, especially in the last couple of years, with how, um, you know, how the state is approaching this. It's a brief memo by the director of the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement's Salt Lake City Field Office, complaining that Utah's jails were not holding those arrested by the federal immigration authorities, and therefore that they were officially designating Utah a, quote, sanctuary state. Utah's leaders quickly shot back in sharp rebuke, but this memo was saying the quiet part out loud. For all its statistical conservatism, Utah's actual policies are far more nuanced. Now, Utah is far from a liberal bastion. The legislator overrode a veto by the governor to pass a ban on transgender girls in women's sports. It passed a near total abortion ban, even if it was later blocked by the state Supreme Court. And like many red states, it passed a series of laws allowing for the banning of individual books deemed objectionable from school libraries. But at the same time, polls conducted in Utah indicate broad support for gun law reform, for expanded sex ed beyond abstinence, and even for free bus service in Salt Lake City. Utah politics break norms. Most policies in America sit on a spectrum where the strength of a given party's hold on a state's legislator correlates cleanly with the likelihood of passing traditionally left or right-leaning laws, yet Utah just does not sit on these spectrums. It's like an alternate reality. It exists outside. The I'd love to hear what you guys' thoughts are on this. If you've experienced this, if you think this is a good thing, a bad thing, uh, or whatever, drop it in the comments below. States as norms. It's like they built a completely different society, but that means they've succeeded because that's exactly why Brigham Young and his first group of pioneers came to the Salt Lake Valley. You can learn a lot about a place by its names. If one starts here at Last Campsite Monument, then follows Emigration Road West passing Donner Hill, where the ill-fated party spent weeks working around rugged terrain long ago on the right, then passing the Hogel Zoo, the region's largest and very much a piece of the present, on the left, there's a small outcropping where a 60-foot tall monument rises from the foothills. By its grandeur, its granite and bronze composition, and its sheer size, it wouldn't be hard to imagine this standing some 1,800 miles or 2,900 kilometers away on the National Mall. 
But look closer at the characters enshrined, and it becomes clear that this celebrates less the westward expansion of a nation, and more the birth of a new one. It was here, or somewhere very near here, that a sick, wagon-bound, travel-weary Brigham Young, the second president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, looked over the Salt Lake Valley and proclaimed that this was the place. The place for what exactly? So this is some cool information about um, the history of Utah. We're gonna skip ahead just a little bit here. ...stationed in Western Illinois. Now, Salt Lake City was not preordained in Mormon theology as any sort of holy land in the religions found. The Great Salt Lake, after all, had yet to even appear on a map when Joseph Smith discovered the Golden Plates, the foundational moment of the religion. But something odd began to happen in the wake of Fremont's trips into the Salt Lake region. With increasing regularity, accounts and excerpts began to appear in the small town newspaper of Nauvoo, where the Mormons had escaped to from Missouri and increasingly believed they now had to escape from. What made the flat lands along the Wasatch Range so alluring was the fact that through the 1840s it hardly existed on maps or in American minds. Unlike Illinois, Texas, California, or Oregon, it was devoid of Anglo-American settlements, overland trails, booming trade, or the rules, laws, regulations, federal administrators, and agents that oversaw such budding developments. On the fringes of two young countries, it's Basically what he's saying is it's the Wild West. ...seemingly uninterested in the territory, a religion on the run from persecution, and one bent on building a civilization in the image of their beliefs, found opportunity. Looking out over the valley beyond the Rockies, south of the Oregon Trail and north of the Spanish Trail, hemmed in by mountains and only within reach of a few indigenous tribes, Brigham Young declared this was the place for a fledgling religion to take root, for a civilization to bloom in the desert, for a city to rise not in the image of the American ideal, but the Mormon ideal. And for the perfect Mormon city, well, fortunately there was a blueprint as Joseph Smith had drawn up a plat map for the city of Zion in 1833, the outlines of a pure city for the pure of heart to await the second coming. It's actually kind of funny looking at this map. Let me just back up just a little bit. Mormon ideal. And for the so looking at this map, um, this is basically exactly what downtown Salt Lake looks like, right? So if we type in Salt Lake City, um, come here to maps. Um, this is exactly how things have turned out. If you actually just zoom in here, um, you can see each of the city blocks. It's it better, yeah, if we go like this. You can see each of the city blocks, it's literally just laid out like a grid would be, uh, which at first is very confusing, but actually once you get used to it, it's incredibly helpful. It's incredibly uh, easy to get used to and know exactly where you're going. You'll know the roads, you'll know exactly what, um, you know, where, where, where things are located, right? If somebody says, hey, this is up on 700 East, you know exactly where that's at. Also should mention that you do have some streets here uh, that will be a little bit confusing. Just a quick little note. Uh, for instance, this one right here, it's a little bit sideways, but it does say South 700 East, right? So S 700 East. I don't know why they put the South on there. The S, the S doesn't mean anything. You can basically just get rid of that. Same thing here, East 600 South, right? This is 600 South. Also people will call it sixth South. So it's not uncommon, uh, for, uh, to, to remove the the last two le uh, numbers of, uh, the direction that you're talking about, right? So if you come down here and you're looking at 1700 South, people will say that's 17th South. For the perfect Mormon city, well, fortunately there was a blueprint as Joseph Smith had drawn up a plat map for the city of Zion in 1833, the outlines of a pure city for the pure of heart to await the second coming. The new Salt Lake City residents did their best to stick to it. Emanating from the temple's location, they laid out massive 660 by 660 foot blocks to accommodate church and municipal functions. It's actually kind of interesting, 660 by 660. I wonder where they came up with that number. Yes. Splitting these blocks were 132 foot wide streets oriented by cardinal directions. Farther from the core was housing, separated from the street by 20 foot side were 132 foot wide. So it says that they were actually set up based on what Joseph Smith had said, all the streets area of one width being eight perches, 132 feet. Directions. Farther from the core was housing, separated from the street by 20-foot sidewalks and 25-foot offsets for yards and gardens. Beyond the housing was room for agriculture along the city south. With such land pushed to the southern edge of town, the city was intentionally dense for the time, ensuring that all saints were connected pieces of a shared city. And as part of the shared city, the standards for cleanliness and order was set high. The emphasis on well-maintained gardens and orchards, for instance, He's talking about cleanliness. I should say, I should say this is something that's incredibly amazing about Utah. Anytime I travel outside of the state, I forget how dirty it is in most every other city, state, country. It's incredible how dirty these other places are. However, here in Utah, it's incredibly clean. People actually take care of their stuff. They throw their trash away. There's not a whole lot of graffiti compared to other places. Um, it's just a much cleaner spot caught the eyes of travelers as early as 1850 and those of the famed naturalist John Muir who visited the valley in 1877. 
While the building's may be long gone, the footprint remains. And if it were difficult from above to pin down the city's spiritual center, well, there's the street names, be it 100 South or 300 East, each informing every visitor just how far they are from the temple. Salt Lake City, while the shining example, is not the only city that adopted such a layout. In Provo, follow the same descending street numbers and you'll find the temple. The same goes in Logan. The same also goes in St. George. Cities more or less- <laughs> Across the whole entire state. The religion's values through design does, after all, make intuitive sense. But ultimately, cities whose existence in the first place can't be explained solely through theology. The settlers weren't just city builders, they were state builders. The dream didn't end with a Mormon city, but a Mormon state, the state of Deseret. With the U.S. wrestling control of the Southwest from Mexico in 1848, Mormons were once again within the confines of the U.S., a country whose laws seemed to come down hard on Mormon practices like polygamy, but didn't seem to protect them from mobs and militias who threatened and attacked the saints in the past. The best recourse, they figured, was statehood, something not necessarily sovereign, but certainly not reliant on the rest of the nation either. As they fought for the expansive Great Basin State they called Deseret with politicians in Washington, they furthered their own self-sufficiency with colony building of their own. Until 2022, St. George's Utah Tech University was called Dixie State. Its nickname, until recently, was the Rebels. Located in Washington County in southwestern Utah, and very far from the American South, this region is called Utah's Dixie. And while stances over names, mascots, and statues have spurred endless debate in the region, the moniker of Dixie dates back to the founding of St. George as part of the church's southern mission to grow warm weather crops such as grapes, figs, and especially cotton. At the same time the church officials were fighting for statehood on their terms, Brigham Young was pushing for self-sufficiency across Mormon society that, in 1861, would only have tenuous connections to the American South with the onset of the Civil War. Colonization as a strategy to self-sufficiency wasn't just a one-off, either. Mantua was founded to source flax, Minersville was for various minerals, while Colville was founded for what its name would suggest. Of course, there is no state of Deseret, and the arrival of the Transcontinental Railroad in 1869 bringing goods and Gentiles downplayed the need for Mormon resource colonies and diversified the population. The arrival of troops, an army base, and a generally increasing federal presence in the territory also ensured it stayed tethered to the nation going forward. An understanding to outsiders who have experienced similar persecution and continued sense of pride state's bounds, Utah's fundamental singularity in its founding has been paved over bit by bit. This makes aspects of the state's differences, its dearth of Dunkin' Donuts or its watered-down beers, seem quaint, trivial, and random. I'm gonna mention, there's hardly any Dunkin' Donuts, so I'm not sure what he's talking about there. Watered-down beer, um, all of our beer is 5%. It didn't used to be that way a couple years ago. Yes, it was by 4.5%, uh, um, so it was a little bit weaker, but that has since changed. Now 5% is the standard dispersed. But here, opinion on LGBTQ or immigrant rights are informed by the same worldview that opens the doors for a burgeoning dirty soda market, one informed both by theology and a shared set of experiences now long mythologized that no state neighboring it, nor really any state in the union, can mirror. So ultimately, the seemingly anomalous actions by the LDS Church can be explained. It supports certain, limited LGBTQ rights, but typically only when it will not directly affect its own discrimination towards the group. The church came out in vocal support for non-discrimination protections that directly excluded itself, yet is still largely opposed to same-sex marriage and certainly does not facilitate them itself. And through the years, the church has barely changed how it itself treats LGBTQ people. All it's changed is its view on how others should treat the group. This is pragmatic for LDS leadership's mission of preserving and expanding the strength of the church. Public sentiment has changed tremendously, and the youngest cohorts of LDS members express majority support for marriage equality. So the more it can be perceived as changing, even without actually changing, the stronger the church. There's definitely uh, some truth to that, right? The older Mormon population is very, very conservative, very against what he was just talking about. The younger population seems to be shifting a little bit more um, liberal, I guess, on that matter. Similar logic underpins its support for expanded rights for undocumented immigrants. Most Mormon men go on a two-year mission somewhere around the world to spread the religion and convert individuals to the faith. A disproportionate number of the 400 or so LDS missions are in South or Central America, given that this is the area of the world in which the church has seen the most success. This is also the area of the world that is the source of much of the undocumented immigration to the U.S., so according to a study done on the matter, missionaries actually gain a more pro-immigrant political view after a post in the area where they might see and experience the forces that drive undocumented immigration. And then in addition, the church seemingly recognizes that it can't be anti-immigrant and simultaneously find success in converting new arrivals to the religion, so it has prioritized the strength of the church. In a society- It's also interesting because I'm sure you'll find different views on both sides, but uh, obviously there's going to be uh, the, the church kind of left where they were, the, 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 excuse me, the pioneers left where they were. They came over to Utah. They basically immigrated from where they were to here to Utah. And so uh, now 
other people from other states, other countries are immigrating either to the United States in general or to Utah. So it's just kind of interesting how the church's stance on that has changed, uh, you know, over time, right? Because obviously the people who made that actual immigration back in the 1800s are long gone. Um, and so just things have changed. So it's just kind of an interesting point that they themselves were in the same boat that now a lot of people are in. It's no wonder that the church has strong centralized control. That control appears focused first and foremost on the church itself, so that creates these scenarios where Utah deviates from national norms in nuanced ways that are convenient to the Mormon mission. The LDS church seemingly understands that to be globally relevant, they have to be viewed as somewhat tolerant globally, not just by the people of Utah. So Utah is a state that has all the legislative ability to pass some of the most conservative laws in the country, but its most powerful institution understands that doing so would be against its own interests. The LDS church is small, so a certain degree of inclusivity is a pragmatic necessity that often trumps any instinct to engage in exclusionary tenets of the culture war. Weirdly, at times, this pulls Utah politics towards the left in a more progressive direction. So put simply, Utah's differences stem from the LDS church's differences. It's a relatively tiny, relatively new religion whose persistence is far less guaranteed than equivalents centered in the Vatican or Mecca. Therefore, their political influence is more rooted in pragmatism. Other churches that influence politics in other states operate at such scale that their political influence appears more firmly rooted in historical inertia. LDS is a different church, and so Utah itself is different. This topic was, at times, difficult to write about since it relates to so many topics that are highly politicized. In yeah, there was a lot of politi politics in that video. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, it was very interesting. I, there wasn't actually as much like, there was a lot of history in this particular video. There were some cool stats that I didn't know. Um, there was a lot of information. So I'm actually really glad I watched this video. Hopefully you found some value in it as well. Again, if I can do anything for you, uh, if you're looking to buy, sell, or invest in real estate here in Utah, please reach out to me, call, text, or email me anytime. My information's here on the screen. And with that said, guys, we'll catch you in the next one.